Star Walker Studios presents Game Master's Journey, your multidimensional RPG podcast. Hello, fellow gamer. Welcome to episode 162 of Game Master's Journey. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker, and on this show, we discuss the craft and the art of game mastering. I've been running RPGs for over 25 years now, and I produce this show in the hopes that you can benefit from my experience, my triumphs, and yes, my screw ups. So many screw ups. I want to welcome you today to season 10 of Game Master's Journey. Holy cow, season 10. I can't believe it. Episode 162. I I can't believe it. This is a really exciting season for the show, and I'm really thrilled to, to be kicking it off today because we've got some awesome new features to Game Master's Journey, some supplements to the podcast, if you will. First of all, we now have monthly live streams. So at the first Wednesday of every month at, I believe, 3 p.m. Pacific time, I do an hour-long live stream on my YouTube channel, and you can go hang out with me live, hang out in the chat room. You can ask me questions. You can propose topics to discuss. And uh, I'm, I'm working on figuring out a way to actually pull audience members into the actual live stream to be on camera with me. And when I get that figured out, and I, I will get that figured out, I promise you, any patrons who are in the audience uh, will get first dibs to, to come on the show with me. So as I said, I do that live stream once a month on the first Wednesday of every month. Also, once a month, I produce a bonus episode of Game Master's Journey. So in addition to the regular weekly episodes of the show, every month there's a bonus episode. And I tried to do something special with those episodes. This is a new thing, so we'll we'll see how it goes. But both of these new features of the show, the monthly live stream and the monthly bonus episodes are thanks to the support of the patrons of the show. These were milestones that I had set up on our Patreon page for Starwalker Studios and we've hit them and I'm really thrilled to do these things and and to have more going on with the show. I'm, I'm really excited about it and there are still more milestones planned, more episodes of the show, more live streams, more Game Master Journey goodness uh, plan for the future. So thank you so much, patrons, for making all that possible. I have a great show for you today. Master cartographer extraordinaire Mike Schley is joining me on the show today, and we're going to have a nice little chat about maps and cartography and world building. And Mike's going to talk to us a bit about a Kickstarter that he's running now called Schleiscapes, which is an awesome resource for GMs out there uh, for all different kinds of systems and uh, worlds that you're using. It's an awesome resource. So we're going to talk about that and uh, we're going to have a good time. And I'm really excited to get Mike on here. So I think that that is is about it for for the beginning of the show today. Sorry for the long pause there as I go through my notes and and make sure that I've uh, told you everything I want to tell you. Um, Just a a couple other quick announcements. I'm still running the Hidden Shrine of Tomawakan on my YouTube channel. Uh, We play that pretty much every Monday uh, at 6 p.m. Pacific time. So you can check us out there. And yeah, lots of stuff going on my YouTube channel these days. I got the the live stream uh, for the show going on, got the actual play going on, and uh, hopefully even more in the future. So stay tuned to Game Master's Journey and uh, uh, continue with us on the journey. So I think that that is is about it for my spiel here at the the top of the show. So I uh, want to get to this interview uh, with Mike Schley because this is fantastic stuff and he's got some really cool stuff to say. So without further ado, let's get on with the interview.
Mike Schley is joining me on the show today. Mike Schley is a master cartographer extraordinaire of many products that you've probably seen out there, not the least of which being the uh, many D&D 5th edition products that Mike has made maps for and illustrations for. So Mike, I, I so much want to welcome you to the show today and thank you for joining us today. And I guess to kick off our conversation, I'll ask you, how did you first get into cartography and map making? And specifically, how did you get into making maps for tabletop RPGs? Yeah, I mean, I've always been interested in um, tabletop games and particularly D&D ever since I was a kid. But as far as actually working in that arena of the game industry, yeah, the thing that brought me in was working for uh, Paizo. I, was, I got a job at Paizo back in 2004 and was immediately tasked to redesign both Dragon and Dungeon magazines with the help of Sarah Robinson. <laughs> Oh, wow. This was back in 2004. Uh, Sean Glenn was the uh, head art director, and he was um, uh, sort of assigning that uh, that design, that redesign and redevelopment to uh, Sarah and I. She, she ended up um, sort of running the dragon end, and I ended up um, being the associate AD for Dungeon. Um, which is kind of what we, what got me into really thinking about maps and gameplay and how GMs interact with the resources that are built into the games that uh, that they're running. Awesome. Yeah, that was a great job. I really enjoyed working with those guys over there. Um, and this was before they started uh, doing Pathfinder. They started working on Pathfinder after, uh, after I uh, left and started doing uh, freelance um, work full time. Just kind of got tired of being a uh, being a manager. <laughs> I wanted to make all the art that I was assigning to other great artists. Yeah, awesome. So, were you doing your your own cartography at that point? Yeah. I, well, I had done cartography as a kid, and you know, just on the side, um, I I've been trained as an artist, um, as a studio artist. Um, I've been training or studying studio arts um, ever since I was a kid. I think my first um, my first formal art class was every Saturday for about five hours a day. My mom would take me to art lessons, you know, formal drawing lessons when I was like eight, nine years old. Um, I did that for a number of years until I went to high school and I went to an arts uh, high school, a governor's school for the arts, which is a magnet school in Virginia and studied art there. Um, I would go to my regular high school and, you know, study science and math and all that, you know, English and all that. And then from noon, I would go there, you know, eight in the morning. And then from uh, noon or one o'clock, I would go to the governor's school, which was um, at a local university. With, I mean, they had like two or 300 students, but I would study nothing but art and art history until about five in the uh, five in the evening. Uh, and did that all through high school, and then uh, went into college, studied um, studio arts as a BFA, uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts major, um, and spent all my time painting and drawing until I was about ready to graduate and uh, started looking for a job because it's hard to get a job straight out of the gate as, you know, quote unquote, an artist. Right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but like yeah. so i looked at uh, illustration and design and i'd already i'd been studying a lot of uh, design so i knew the uh, fundamentals of page layout and you know the use of type and organizing space um and you know work making sure that projects were attractive yet readable and delivered um, delivered to an audience in a way uh, you know that's commercially viable so when i left school I immediately went to work for a company called Decipher, um, which was down the road from, you know, where I had uh, been going to college. Um, they created uh, trading card games or uh, collectible card games. Whatever. Um, they created trading card games for uh, Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, Lord of the Rings. At the time, they were just doing Star Wars and Star Trek um, and Austin Powers and how to host a murder mystery, that kind of thing. And I came in with them as a designer who didn't know a whole lot, but <laughs> had a good uh, visual sensibility and was really, you know, was really good at drawing and painting. 
So um, I gave myself a crash course in Photoshop and design, because uh, this was back in 2000, and started designing their uh, point of purchase you know, boxes and card, uh, card layouts um, and game elements. And I worked for them uh, for a while. We did the Lord of the Rings trading card game, which I won a, well, the um, art group, my, my group won an Origins Award for in 2001, no, 2000, uh, stretching my memory. I think it was around 2002, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was for the Lord of the Rings uh, trading card game. We won a uh, Best Design Award, um, which actually that ended up getting me my job at Paizo because Sean Glenn, the art director that I eventually ended up working under, um, was up was nominated for the same award. And when he lost it, or not when he lost it, but when our group <laughs> won it, he made a note and he remembered that it kind of stuck under his skin. But uh, when uh, I was chatting with him over uh, over email, um, like I think that was the thing that uh, finally pushed him uh, pushed him to go ahead and hire me, <laughs> um, and led led me into uh, RPGs in a direct way. Um, Decipher had published. RPGs um, or an RPG series for Lord of the Rings, which actually kind of led me into really falling in love again with maps. Like when I was a kid, I always loved maps and I collect all the um, fold out inserts from National Geographic and, you know, as well as uh, uh, the old gazetteers from um, D and D uh, and, you know, any kind of fantasy map that I could get a hold of my, get my hands on was up on my wall. But when uh, when we when I was working for Decipher and they were working on the Lord of the Rings um, role playing game, we would get these beautiful maps in, and and uh, I would just pour over them back in the uh, back in the room where we you know would do um, film editing. I would just sit back there on the light table and look at these maps. And uh, then after I, when I was working for um, for Paizo, you know, I fell in love with uh, maps again, you know, working with guys like uh, Robert Lazzaretti, Chris West, and, um, you know, a lot of the folks that were making maps for us at the time. Um, and I would just, ha I would have almost as much fun, you know, staring at them <laughs> and, you know, getting lost in them as, uh, you know, I'm sure they, they'd have making them. And uh, one thing led to another in one week, um, I ended up, or one month, I ended up um, not having someone to work on a project. That see that one of the reasons why I actually got into map making at the time was that I my stable of good cartographers was really really small. Um, I mean, there were a lot of folks that make maps, but a lot of the illustrators that I was working with for the um, artwork ends of uh, the magazine, you know, they they were much more interested in you know making uh, doing um, character portraits or scenes or you know things with a lot of action. Okay. So um, there weren't as many cartographers, which led you know me one month to have to do my own uh, map making for one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the adventures, and I just fell in love with it all over again. And uh, realized that um, Watson needed a lot of ma needed map makers because they were having the same problem I was. Um, and next thing you know, I'm doing maps full time for D and D because you know I was doing it on the side. And my wife finally came to me and was like, "Look, you're spending way too much time working. You need to choose one or the other." <laughs> And <laughs> as a result, you know, I had a sort of a come to Jesus moment where I said, yeah, I enjoy making the artwork much more than I enjoy managing other artists. Um, not that I have anything against other artists or art directors. It's just I, I really I love making art. I mean, that's the thing that I feel like I was born to do. Um, so and luckily, I've been able to um, find a way to do that um, successfully over the last uh 20 years of professional work. Um, actually, it's been more than 20 years. When I was in college, I was my first job as an artist was working as a uh, um, studio assistant to an, a uh, medical illustrator who uh, has since gone on to his own arts career outside of illustration. But I kind of got the, um, I dove into the deep end in that like immediately after, uh, after I was hired for that job, which was in my early 20s, um, I was doing drawings for court cases and for medical uh, instruction um, booklets and books. Um, that was 
even though it was illustration, it was a far cry from, from the kind of work that I do now, but it gave me a great understanding of how to operate as a storyteller and as a visual artist in a, um, in a real way, as opposed to, you know, just going to school and hoping that someday you'll land a job as an artist. Yeah. So if that, if that all makes sense. Yeah. I'm sorry if I'm rained like too much. No, no, that's fine. So that's interesting. So you, you came at this definitely uh, from the art side. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it sounds like you, you were playing RPGs all, all along or for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I, I remember um, breaking open the red box with a buddy of mine when we were in middle school or earlier than that when I was in elementary school. They were very rudimentary games. I mean, <laughs> we were little kids, so we didn't know half of what you know what we were doing half the time. <laughs> yeah, but, but I loved the maps, and you know, um, I loved the process of exploring new spaces. Um, so the thing that I remember the most was that that process of you know having a piece of uh, grid uh, grid paper out in front of me, and uh, my buddy who was playing the GM. It was just the two of us. He was playing the GM and I was exploring this um, this world or this rudimentary map that he had made and the creatures that he had populated it with. And um, so that process of two people interacting over a world that not only had the GM built, but that I was actively developing by my own actions, that that's always stuck with me as something incredibly fascinating how you can have this mutually subjective experience turn into something that's more than the sum of its parts so you've got all these people kind of huddled around a dining room table maybe eating dinner or having drinks or um, basically combining or joining in to tell a story whose end goal or whose the direction isn't necessarily cut in stone Right. So the, um, the GM has a general idea of the narrative that they want to build towards. They have a plot, they have plot devices and they have fl- a flow and they have an overall sense of the direction that the campaign's going in. But it's really the combination of that structure combined with the player's um, subjective influence that allows the story to be told in a much more active um, sort of freeform way. And that, um, that mutual creation or that, that uh, joint creation um, has always been something that I've been really, really fascinated with. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I, I can definitely see a, a, a very um, clear trajectory <laughs> of, of <laughs> how you, how you got into this and um, yeah making making all these these great maps for for the games we play nice thanks i that's the the one thing that i um that i really enjoy the most is not only creating worlds that i find fascinating and and by that you know a lot of the times i'm exploring the map as i'm drawing it as i'm developing it um but also just the idea that the artwork that i make can spark new stories or new storytelling and new adventures on its own by the GM or the players developing it in ways that I didn't expect, you know? So, uh, you know, if, if one little detail, and I tend to put, I, I tend to make very detail rich maps, even though I try and keep them visually from be, from becoming too cluttered, I still try and give as much, as many visual seeds for the GM to riff off of and the players to investigate. Um, as possible so the idea like the fact that with all the artwork that comes with a role-playing game or you know that's provided in a campaign from the uh, from the gm all of the illustrate you know i love making artwork and i love illustrating but a lot of times those little illust- like character illustrations or monsters or scenes those you really only see for a couple of seconds at a time when, you know, flash a card up and say, this is what you see when you come around the corner. Yeah. But when you've got a really, really gorgeous map out on the table and it's there for the better portion of a session or a couple of sessions, or maybe it's a world map that's on the wall that's referred to over the course of a campaign. Those are things that have the ability to really influence 
the entirety of that experience. So the fact that somebody may be pouring over my map for hours at a time, literally, that compels me to do a, as good a job as I possibly can and to really give them something that rewards that kind of investigation. So, you know, I may include little details that only 1% or, you know, a very small number of people might see. But when they see that or when they find those little things, I want that payoff or I, I want there to be something, something there that they can really get excited about. Yeah, that's re- that's really cool. I I never really thought about it that way. But but you're totally right. We spend way more time looking at a map than we would, like you said, like a picture of a monster or something. Mm-hmm. It's a really good point. Yeah, not that I have anything against great pictures of monsters. I've got a couple of them in, uh, or I've got a spider bear that I'm really having fun with in uh, Schleiscapes yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, and in the um, as the as that series progresses, there's going to be a lot more uh, character and monster illustrations and scenes, like cutaway uh, views, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I still feel like the crux of what I do is always going to be building these worlds. Like it's all really going to center around the map in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, even if I was doing a, uh, a graphic novel, which is a project that I have kind of tied into shy escapes down the road. I don't want to talk about too, uh, talk about that too much. It's still in the works, but that's still going to incorporate this world um, as well as, you know, playable utilizable maps um, in conjunction with the, uh, with the graphic novel. But that's, that's further down the road. <laughs> yeah, well, I definitely know what you're talking about because I remember reading um, like the, the Lord of the Rings books or like uh, mm-hmm. the Wheel of Time and always flipping back to the map in the beginning of the book and, and kind of seeing uh, where the heroes are going. And, mm-hmm. you know, those weren't even like anything on the level of like, well, I guess the Wheel of Time, they have a nice full color map in the like in the cover yeah. But um, a lot of times in those fantasy novels, they're just black and white, you know, line art maps. They're not super detailed. So so nothing mm-hmm. like uh, what we're used to in, in D&D or like the maps you make. But it I mean, it definitely makes you want to learn more about the world and oh, what's over there and what's on top of that mountain. And yeah, yeah, they're very uh, inspiring, I guess is the word. <laughs> I, uh, I actually had the good fortune um, over the last few years to do um, a series of interior maps for Garth Nix's Old Kingdom series. Oh, cool. um, he's a fantasy author. Um, the first one I did was for Clariel, uh, which is part of the series, and then uh, uh, Golden Hand uh, a little bit later. But um, And I've done a whole lot of interior maps for like HarperCollins, Scholastic, Little Brown and Company, and fantasy novels that harken back to the golden era of interior of book illustration essentially but take that format of an interior map because all the fantasy books that i read as a kid they always had maps in them sometimes you know some were better than others but um i still loved being able to refer to that world as i'm as i'm reading the story you always want to sort of check back it check back in with the map and to see where the uh, where the where the story is leading, um, especially with like the um, uh, in a world that's more difficult to uh, visualize. Like um, I worked on the I think it was the uh, uh, Veronica Roth um, wrote a uh, book series that started off with Di- Divergent, and it's sort of a post-apocalyptic um, uh, science fiction um, novel set in uh, the U.S. after. Uh, great devastation but anyways the in that novel there was a um they needed a cutaway view of the uh of a compound the the novel was called divergent i think they made a movie out of it a couple of years back yeah yeah. with a sequel right so the main compound in that was built underneath um the ruins of chicago of downtown chicago and as well as into some of the buildings and they needed a cutaway essentially an illustrated cutaway map of that space, which would have been ridiculous to try and map out, you know, in a traditional kind of top down way. So um, that allowed me to sort of combine my understanding of cartography with um, illustration, which 
has led to, well, they, that's kind of been in conjunction. I've been working on cutaway views and illustrated maps in conjunction with my regular top-down maps, okay. um, which, which is a lot of fun, but a hell of a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. So in kind of broad strokes, can you kind of walk us through like your creative process of how, how you create a map from the moment where you're like, I need a map of something to, mm-hmm. you know, how you get from there to, to like a map we would see in like a D and D product. Yeah, sure. So if I'm working with a client, um, like if I'm working with wizards of the coast or, um, you know, a book publisher or a game publisher, um, I tend to, I typically get, uh, details or art and art order for, from the uh, art director that gives me a general outline. Like I usually try and prompt the author or the designers of the game to give me as much, um, text content or as much of the feel of the story and details of the location or the world, um, as possible. So if they've got like a, um, a uh, world guide or you know, like a uh, an art style guide um i try and get a hold of that just so that i can get a sense of the flavor of the world and th- the thing about D is that um i spend i spend a lot of time thinking about the overall design and how the maps and the artwork that i make create a tone for that world for you know the forgotten realms and as a result you know i i spend a lot of time thinking about um you know, the design of my compass roses and, you know, everything from like the border treatments to, uh, you know, the housing architecture or, you know, it does Menzo feel like it's in the underdark. So I'll figure all that out first. And then, um, I usually do a lot of sketching on paper just to start, uh, just to work things out in my head. Um, uh, which by the way, uh, Oh, what was the? I think the most difficult map I've drawn was the map of um, oh god, the city underneath uh, Waterdeep, um, Skullport. Oh. Skullport. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that image, but imagine an isometric or an at angle illustrated map of a city on three levels inside of a cavern. Oh man! Um, <laughs> just, <laughs> just technically, that was such a that was a that was uh, yeah, that was a tough one. Uh, but I thought it came out pretty well. Um, Great perspective exercise, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Pulling my hair out, and I'm freehanding the whole thing. Other than like, I'll, so for my isometric maps, typically, um, if I have a top-down view of like a city, for instance, you know, all the buildings have footprints, and I'm able to basically take that flat plane, bring it into Photoshop, create a perspective grid, and then just freehand the whole thing over top of that. Okay. footprint that i've got that's essentially the buildings laid out but if i'm doing a traditional top-down map um i'll do the sketches um i lay out my grid honestly from the get-go because i want the um, artwork and the walls and everything to line up to that grid perfectly okay. so that you know i don't have any kind of uh weird you know screwed up hallways that are too narrow or off uh, off in alignment um and i've just got that that grid layer kind of at a very reduced level so that it's not visually clutter, uh, you know, cluttering, but I can use it as a guideline. Um, and then I go in and um, lay in my pencils as a, it, this kind of gets sort of technical. You sort of need to know Photoshop, but I'll lay in sort of a overlay of my sketch, my sketch just so I can sort of see where everything's laid out. And then I go in and ink the whole thing just by hand, typically, um, and then once the, uh, once the ink layer is done and I've sort of explored the space and created it as I'm drawing it, I'll send those, uh, those inks in for review, you know, with my art director and t- typically if there's text, I'll add text at that point, send it out, um, for review, uh, get any notes back. And if it's good to go, I'll, uh, lay in my colors and that's, I work at a, um, uh, I've got a 30 inch uh, iMac or a 30 inch um, Apple monitor and a uh, Wacom and just a uh, just a little Mac Mini, <laughs> which <laughs> does the trick. Um, and uh, just draw it on my, uh, draw in the uh, the colors like I was using uh, water like watercolor effects brushes in uh, Photoshop, 
And so it's, it's very similar to my traditional ink and wash work that I, you know, did years ago on, you know, paper or on watercolor paper, except that it's in a digital format. And as a result, I can make changes super quick and it really expedites the process. Um, so it's a nice, it's a nice merging of traditional and digital techniques. Um, and I guess I picked up both of the, I picked up the traditional techniques through my training as a studio artist and as a fine artist. And I picked up the digital uh, techniques and the design understanding, you know, working for companies like Decipher and Paizo and um, being a, uh, being an, an illustrator as it were. So having those experiences and also having experiences as a true designer and true art director, as well as an artist, all those things sort of merged into um, me being able to not only create artwork that I find compelling, but to be able to deal with art directors pretty easily because I know the, you know, I know how hard that job is and I know what they look for and how to keep them happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So sure. uh, it's, it, as a result, the, it's uh, worked out really well. And I have a lot of great um, relationships with a lot of really wonderful art directors and uh, companies out there. So just for anyone listening who who maybe doesn't know, uh, what are some of the recent RPG products that you've worked on? Okay, so uh, let's, let's see if I can remember them all. I've literally lost track of how many pieces of artwork have been published um, in the last 20 years. Like, I'm, I think I'm somewhere between two and 3,000. Wow. Um, but the, the most recent books uh, have been for Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, fifth edition my the, the most recent one that came out was um tales from the yawning portal uh before that um let's see the uh storm king's thunder had pieces that i had done previously that were sort of repurposed for that book okay um and that included a massive map of the northwest section of Faroon that i created for the sword coast adventurers guide um, which was huge, and I can go into detail about working on that monster after <laughs> after this. Um, that was a lot of fun, <laughs> um, but a lot of work. The uh, the project I did before that was um, Princess of the Apocalypse. Uh, and then before that was the um, let's see the D and D Fifth Edition starter uh, set, the Lost Minds of Fandelver. and then before that I worked on the um, uh, DMG, I did a bunch of cutaway illustration and scene illustration for the Dungeon Master's Guide. Not a, not all of which went into it, but um, there was a lot, still a lot of work that uh, that I produced for it. So basically, if you've been playing D and D, you've you've seen your stuff, whether you realize it yeah. or not. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and I could probably go on for another hour just recounting all the books <laughs> I've worked on for D and D. Um, besides D&D, I've also worked on mobile games. Um, there's a series called Sorcery for um, the Apple um, uh, iPhones and iPads, and um, it's in the Android market. Um, that was based on a, an author named Steve Jack, not Steve Jackson Games, but a different author named Steve Jackson who had a uh, series of Choose Your Own Adventure books, which I actually played back in the 80s or loved reading back in the 80s. And uh, Inkle Games turned that into an interactive, um, much more in-depth uh, storytelling experience on, uh, you know, on mobile devices that are just a ton of fun and really capture that sense of um, fantasy, your decisions really affecting the story in fundamental ways um, type of game. And uh, I did a ton of maps for them and cutaway views for encounter locations um and end up doing a 3d map that was uh a whole lot of fun but another whole nother ball of wax um so yeah i've been busy <laughs> yeah it sounds like it it, it might have been yeah. easier to ask what what D products didn't you work on that, that might have been the easier <laughs> Anything, way to approach that <laughs> yeah I, I think there were a number that uh jared blando uh worked on that i haven't had a chance to work on that like the uh rise of tmx series i didn't have uh, much in but that was a few years ago yeah um there's a number uh there's another uh and well there's a book coming out there's a new adventure coming out this fall and i don't know how much i can talk about it um but i know that they've already mentioned it the uh 
uh, Tomb of Annihilation. Yes. yes. Um, and apparently at Origins last week, it came out that um, I did all the maps for that. So, uh, well, there awesome. you go. Um, awesome. And it's there's a ton. Hey, <laughs> I won't go into it anymore, but there's a lot of great maps in that book. So if you like maps and you like my work, take a look. Yeah, yeah. And I'm currently running uh, The Hidden Shrine of Tomawakan on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you were kind enough to let me use your uh, high-res maps for roll 20 on that so if you check that out you can see some of your maps in in like uh high definition (laughs) (laughs) nice that's one of the most rewarding things um in the last few years is seeing folks um there's been a number of um uh, gms and players and fans that have shared um photos of their game rooms with, you know, my maps um, printed out, either displayed on their walls or on the table during game sessions. And uh, just the the outpouring of appreciation from the uh, from the community has been absolutely wonderful. That's what keeps me doing, you know, what I do in a lot of ways. Um, because, you know, the, the gaming industry and the gaming community more broadly, uh, are just really some of the most wonderful fans and most supportive um, audience members that uh, that I can imagine. I mean, that's what's kept me in that industry or in this industry in this field for so long um, is just the uh, yeah, how great the fans are. And one can actually get a lot of, if not all, of your maps on your website in digital and physical versions, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got um, high-res uh, versions for download, and I've got physical print versions um, for sale as well. Um, that's Those are at uh, prints.mikeshalai.com, or if you just go to M-I-K-E-S-C-H-L-E-Y.com, um, there's a little shop button there, and you can find everything that's, uh, everything that's there. Plus, there's a link to the new uh, Schleiscapes Kickstarter um, that's out right now. It's doing really well. This is Mike Shalai, and you're listening to Game Master's Journey. I want to take a minute to give a quick shout out to the patrons of Starwalker Studios. The support of the patrons makes this show possible. If you enjoy Game Master's Journey and you'd like to give a little back, becoming a patron is a great way to do so. It's because of the patrons that all the listeners of Game Master's Journey enjoy a bonus episode every month as well as the Game Master's Journey live stream. I would also like to give a huge shout out and thank you to my tier five patron, Mr. Steve Strickland. Let's hear it for Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You the man. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you to all the patrons. You can find out more about becoming a patron by clicking on the Patreon button at the top of the show notes at starwalkerstudios.com. You know, a big focus of this show is world building so yeah i'd really like to talk about your your schleiscapes so yeah tell us all about it okay so (laughs) (laughs) thank you so um one of the things that i've really uh, been chomping at the bit to uh get to do is to basically build build my own um sort of storytelling world that can be imported into pretty much any any role-playing game uh, campaign or any fantasy RPG campaign. And um, I finally had the chance or at least the opportunity to really focus on it and um, get it out the door, get it, get it off the ground. So in Schleiscapes, what I'm creating, and it's, it's really a, it's a digital project, even though I do uh, offer vinyl, um, vinyl battle maps, but in a single PDF, I want it, well, a PDF and associated JPEG files. What I want to do is provide great maps, art, and story seeds about an, 
a single encounter in each episode so that you can either use those resources from that single episode in your homebrew and, you know, modify them and print them and play with them as long as you like. Just don't use them commercially or redistribute them. But I want you to be able to have access to great visual and storytelling uh, resources that can be easily ported into your game, whether you're printing them out for tabletop use or whether you're using the digital files for BTTs. Um, so in a single PDF, for instance, you get the full poster map of the location um, that you can print through a, a large format printer, or if you you know take it to a print shop, you can uh, print it out through a print shop. And you have my permission to do that. There's a uh, there's um, verbiage in the uh, PDF that lets you do that. Um, so in addition to that large version, um, along with a bunch of little discoverable areas that are set to the side in, or you can print them set to the side, but you can also print them out as what I'm calling uh, discovery tiles. So in addition to the large print version, the entire map is uh, cut into nine separate uh, letter size uh, letter size tiles or letter size pages. They're all um, tiled out so that they're eight um, five foot squares wide by ten five foot squares tall. So in nine sections, you can lay out the entire map, either in full color or a super ink efficient black and white line version. And then on top of that, there are areas that you can open up and discover so that when your players, you know, check out what looks like a little hole or a little uh, burrow entrance, when they go down into that, when they, you know, say, all right, I want to hop down into that burrow entrance, there's an additional, uh, like an additional three by five tile that you can lay down on top of that that opens that area up and shows what's underneath it. Um, same thing for the cottage, for instance, when you walk into the kitchen, there's a separate tile you can lay down and just, you know, if you put a little piece of um, poster tack on the back, it'll hold it in place, but um, you can lay down that tile and it's essentially an easy, attractive, fog, you know, fog of war mechanic. Same thing goes for secret rooms. You know, when you make your uh, make your check to see if you've discovered a uh, secret door, when that opens up, you should be able to easily display that in a quick um, a quick way on the table. So, on top of that, um, in the BTT files, um, I've included each of the uh, separate areas as um, separate maps, so that you can display them, you know, as you like. And like, if you're using Fantasy Grounds and you want to use their Fog of War um, mechanic, then uh, they're easily and quickly. Uh, quickly importable and usable. So they come in 300 DPI or PPI versions, 100 PPI and uh, 50 PPI versions um, so that they're, you know, no, uh, no sweat to uh, um, use over a decent internet connection. Yeah, that's really awesome because especially uh, your, your discovery tiles and how you, you've, you've basically come up with, a product where if we're running like more traditionally around a table with physical maps, we can, like you said, have like basically fog of war, which is really mm -hmm. easy to do with something like roll 20 or fantasy grounds. But when you have like this big, huge map on the table, it's a lot more difficult to hide parts of it, you know? So yeah. I, it's a really cool way how you've kind of solved that problem. And one of the big one of the big things that I was thinking about also was how to how to show a map and not automatically give away the fact that there are discover discoverable areas on the map. Yeah. You know, because like if you've got a uh, if you've got a map laid out and um, you know you've got big chunks of paper over top of it already <laughs> or if you've got a big towel over an area yeah that's a pretty good giveaway <laughs> that's where you want to go yeah but um with the discovery tiles essentially you can lay out the map and then once they you know once you you can let the storytelling um sort of guide their uh, their exploration through the space as opposed to clunky um mechanics that might um give away too much at the beginning yeah. So 
I spent a lot of time thinking about the actual design of the uh, of the map artwork, but I've also included illustrations and story seeds that are directly related to this overarching world that I'm building the maps into. Um, it's the world of Fernway. Um, basically, Fernway means wanderlust in uh, German. Um, and uh, there's a whole setting that each of the episodes are going to be sort of building out. So with each episode, they they can be standalone um, adventures or standalone encounters. But as the series progresses, they're going to progress in a way similar to a campaign so that even though they're system independent, they can be followed whether you know you're playing with um, 3.5 mechanics in Pathfinder or whether you're you know playing five uh, fifth edition D D or whether you're playing old school D D. Um, the idea is that you should have um, artwork and maps and stories that you can either import into your game into your own uh, homebrew or build a campaign out of as you know, the series moves on. And honestly, you know, if I can keep working on the series and working on this world, this is a lifetime uh, project for me. So Schleiscapes building into this other project that I have um, that's more narrative based, um, but still includes maps and, you know, uh, visual art. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm focused on. But don't worry, I'm still making D&D maps. <laughs> I'm still making artwork for uh, Dungeons and Dragons. This isn't me, you know, uh, thumbing my nose at anybody. It's uh, just me working on something that um, that I can really fall in love with and, you know, push forward as a personal project. Well, I think you're, you're preaching to the choir here because many of uh, the listeners of this show are, are uh, world builders on, on their free time. So... <laughs> <laughs> It's I don't so think you have fun. to explain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us more so, about uh, your world of, of Fernway, kind of uh, what it's like? Yeah, I'm um, they, the first <clears throat> the first thing that I was thinking about um, was that I want I honestly want the world to act as a reflection of our own world. So a lot of, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, thought put into uh, politics or emotional uh, responses to changes when worlds are turned upside down in a lot of ways. So to, uh, to avoid giving away too much um, at the beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of the series, I'm um, talking about the, um, the, so in this world, there's a moon that's essentially geostationarily locked. And it's called the Tain. And the Tain is a um, old word that uh, references a mirror or a, um, a, a sort of a duality or a reflection of oneself. So the Tain in the sky, imagine a gigantic moon that's always there, that is never not, you know, it, it's, it's never been out of view. So all of these folks that are in Fern Way have this thing to relate to that um, if you're navigating the world, like you wouldn't need necessarily a compass or anything on a, um, a cloudless day or a cloudless night because you'd always have the moon to refer back to. You'd always have a point of reference, right? Cool. So imagine a world where in that system, the point of reference, which or as far back as anyone can ever remember, has always been stable. What if that point of reference, what if that moon, moon suddenly moved? And it may not have to move a lot, but just enough that it would be like the, um, the rug being pulled out from under you, you know? Yeah. And that sort of acts as the harbinger for all of these changes in this world where essentially it's a, low fantasy world turning into a high fantasy world, whether they like it or not. Cool. And how that, how the people in that world and how um, uh, that world's affected by that change or by these changes is what I'm exploring and what I want to kind of propel the story. Um, so yeah, that's uh, sort of the, the skinny of the beginning. Very cool. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I think. I think I think any good world, you know, needs some kind of like cool concept or idea 
that's at the heart of it, or at least is like kind of the, the launching point. And, mm-hmm. and that's, that's really cool. And, and I think I, I can kind of, maybe I'm projecting here, but I can kind of see how this world was uh, developed by a cartographer, th- this whole idea of, <laughs> <laughs> of this moon that everybody references. That's, that's great. Yeah. And in that, in addition, in addition to that, I, I really want to spend time thinking about how we navigate the world and how we sort of come, come like our, our sense of self and our sense of presence, you know, is, is formed in a lot of ways by how we see our relationship to the greater world around us. So if there's something that really upsets that ball, of, you know, upsets that horse and cart, how that can affect our chain, you know, our, uh, our own personalities or our, uh, the way that we respond to the world around us. Um, in the broader sense, you know, people's true characters really come out in moments of crisis. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, in this world, like, because so much of, uh, because so much of what's going on is tied in with this reorientation or this um, uh, sense of dislocation, something is going on behind the scenes. And as a result, you know, all the cartographers and explorers that have been actively, you know, that understand the world have been disappearing for some reason. And it's not that they're just disappearing when they're out, you know, at the far edges of the world, they're disappearing from their own beds and disappearing from, uh, you know, places in town where you would think that uh, they would be nice and safe. So um, I'll kind of, tease that out as the uh, as the story progresses and um, tease out what's causing these changes because they're much bigger than just the moon moving um, but the moon moving is in a sense a uh, a harbinger or a symbol um, albeit a big visual symbol <laughs> <laughs> that there's something going on under the surface um, so yeah, I don't want to give up give away too much more, but that's the that's the general uh, lead off. That's awesome. Thanks. I'm I'm excited to see where this goes. Thank you, thank you. Um, so far the Kickstarter's uh, done you know great, um, and I've got the uh, the time and resources to really push this forward. So you know uh, when uh, when it really gets in full swing, I would love to be able to produce, you know, a full episode a month or every, uh, every two months, um, so that you could follow it like a, uh, like, you know, a episodic narrative story. Um, right now it's probably going to be a few months between episodes. Um, just because I'm a, a, on top of all this, I've decided to go back to graduate school and finish my MFA because I'm insane (laughs) and and, uh, apparently didn't have enough work to do already. There you go. (laughs) But um, yeah, so uh, I'll be balancing all of that and uh, making the best maps and best artwork that I can uh, and trying to tell the best stories that I can over the next couple of years. And then um, once, uh, once this other project that's more narratively uh, driven um, is ready to launch, I'll, uh, I'll announce that and keep the two sort of moving forward. Um, Because Schleiscapes is, even though it's narratively driven, um, it's really more about providing resources in a campaign setting for gamers. Whereas the other project that's in the same world, um, albeit maybe at a different time in the world, um, that's more of a graphic novels format that has Art, artwork that can also be incorporated into the game. So imagine reading a graphic novel and every issue of the graphic novel, uh, the setting that your, you know, protagonists are, uh, that find that they find themselves in also comes with a great map and awesome resources that you can work in your own campaign. Awesome. That sounds great. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I got my work cut out for me. Yeah, I'm really curious as as you're um, developing this this world that you're creating, um, where, like like how how is the map making coming into it? Like how early in the process were you sketching out maps and like what 
do, do you come up with the map first and then and then you fill it with ideas or do you come up with ideas and then make a map like how does that how does that work I don't know. Like if you look at my sketchbooks, it's all over the place. Okay. Kind of back so, and forth. <laughs> um, yeah, it really, it really is. I, in a lot of ways, I let the maps inform the story and a lot, in a lot of ways, I let the story inform the maps um, just because they're so intricately enmeshed um, in the storytelling. I, I would have a hard time like, and a lot of times, like a, when I said that I'm, exploring the map as i draw it i mean that's very literally true so okay. i often think about storytelling you know once i've drawn a map because that i i try and put in details not only for myself but for other uh for my audience or for gms i try and put in details that spark that um that storytelling capacity so a lot of times I'll develop my story off my map, but at the same time, you know, I do, I love, you know, just writing compelling, uh, uh, compelling short fiction. And that often requires, you know, mapping from a more sort of assignment driven kind of framework. Yeah. Um, more like, you know, more like a traditional um, game company where essentially you have writers and editors, like, you know, at Paizo, I, we would have writers and editors building the, uh, folks building the adventure scenario and then we would need to assign maps that could elucidate or flesh out that story um sometimes that's how you know it works in my own head okay. um, other times i'm just drawing maps and making uh, making stories out of them as the maps kind of unfold or as this visual arc of the world unfolds cool if that makes sense yeah yeah i had a feeling it was probably something like that yeah, it's it, and I've got tons and tons of sketchbooks that are just notes of me going back and forth, you know, hashing out ideas by drawing things out or writing things out first. And I mean, they're a mess, but it's a lot of um, it's a it, it's a lot of compelling resources to then sort of formalize into a uh, cohesive whole. So. Yeah, well, I will um, definitely put links to the Schleiscapes kickstarter in the show notes as well as to your your website where people can check out all your maps and everything one more thing i wanted to uh, mention was i came up with a, i put together a, a fun little instagram uh, explorable game right um yeah. have you have you ch checked out the schleiscapes episode one preview um instagram page yes i i did I did. I needed yeah, a little so, help from you on it, but but I finally oh, I, I finally got in there. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm I'm still uh, working the kinks out of it, but it's it, it the format seems like it would be perfect. Just the Instagram grid format um, and the ability to link to other profiles, essentially utilizing that format as a way to explore map and to in, you know embeds other artists into the map or um, be able to move from one map to another just by clicking on profile links so that, yeah. you know, you can start with one area and explore kind of like exploring discovery tiles just through that Instagram interface. Um, that was a heck of a lot of fun to make. And it was super quick after I uh, had the artwork already, you know, worked out for Schleiscapes. I was like, Hey, why don't I, put together a preview trailer that could be like a like an explorable movie trailer um yeah. just in that instagram format um that's a lot of that was a lot of fun yeah well thank you for reminding me of that i will i will link to, to that too so people can go go check that out because that's a it's a great preview of what the schleiscapes is going to be yeah yeah awesome so was there anything else you wanted to talk about or, or let people know about just, uh, just keep exploring and tell great stories. I mean, that that's that's pretty much it. I, I am, um, you know, I'm really committed to making things that really that bring, or that sort of push the boundaries of what's capable um, at, you know, at your table, or what you can do with um, with the games in front of you, and if you know the work. If the work that I do provides great stories 
that gaming groups can tell years down the road, then, you know, I, I couldn't be happier. So, um, yeah, I'll keep making, uh, I'll keep making maps as long as there's folks that still keep playing, uh, playing RPGs. Awesome. And can people find you on Twitter or anywhere else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm on Twitter at, at Shalai. That's at S C H L E Y. I'm on Google, Google plus, uh, Mike Shalai. Um, I'm on Facebook, Mike Schley Illustration and Design, uh, Instagram, Schleyscapes or Mike Schley. Uh, am I, oh, and I've got a Tumblr site uh, for folks that are interested in cartography or art or me just rambling on. Um, if you go to uh, Schley Tutorials um, over at Tumblr, then that's uh, that's my page too. And I give uh, tips, tricks, and, uh, you know, lots of, uh, lots of useless information too, I'm sure, <laughs> but uh, some good stuff over there. Awesome. Well, I've I've got to check that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm wanting to do some some mapping with with zero talent, so I'm I'm sure you can oh, you, you can help me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's another uh, great tutorial site. Um, it's called uh, Fantasy uh, Fantasy Maps. Uh, John, um, basically, I I think I link to it on uh, on Twitter a lot and uh on my um facebook page but uh yeah there's a lot of great re- oh oh i gotta put a plug in for um cartographers guild if you're interested in mapping and this is in no way a paid plug <laughs> it's just one of my <laughs> favorite sites on the web um cartographers guild is a great location to uh see other art uh, see other artists map work or to get feedback on your own cartography or just um, shoot the shit with other folks that, uh, really, really dig, uh, great maps. So go check them out. Yeah. I've, uh, I've been all over cartographers guild. I love that site. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's good stuff. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on and, and talking to us, Mike. Uh, really appreciate it. This was a whole lot of fun. I hope, uh, I hope I didn't ramble on too much. Um, no, not at all. Yeah, it's super enjoyable. I just have one other question for you that I, I forgot to ask you. And that is, uh, where in the world are you? <laughs> where <laughs> I'm actually in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, I live uh, out on the East Coast. Um, I've been here for about four years. My wife and I moved out here when she went to graduate school, and um, there's so much history and uh, so much um, so much to do and see out here uh, in the birthplace of America. Yeah. That uh, yeah, I've, I've really uh, really been enjoying it. It's a great spot. Wow, so we're we're coast to coast right now. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's it. <laughs> wow, awesome. Although I did live uh, I did live in um, Seattle for a while, and I've bounced I've bounced all over the uh, all over the U.S. I've lived in Seattle, Arizona, North Carolina, Florida, Virginia. Wow. Um, pretty much every corner. Well, just about every corner. Um, nice. And I think it's that wanderlust, you know, it's Fernway coming out in me <laughs> um, yeah. every, every five years or so I, I get this itch to move to someplace I've never seen before. Awesome. Well, you are welcome back anytime you want to come and talk about maps and art and all that good stuff. Oh, thank you, Lex. I'd, I'd be more than happy to come back. You were a great host. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm sure I could pick your brain for hours. <laughs> oh, that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> Well, that is going to wrap it up for episode 162 of Game Master's Journey. If you'd like to get a hold of me, please visit the website starwalkerstudios.com. There you can email me, find my Twitter, Google+, Facebook, Pinterest, and YouTube information, and the Game Master's Journey voicemail number where you can call and leave me a message. If your feedback or question is entertaining or enlightening, or both, you may even bet or you might even hear your message on the show. If you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions for future topics, I would love to hear from you. Also at the website, you can find a link to the Game Master's Journey community where you can share ideas with other listener GMs. Finally, you can learn about how you can support the show by becoming a patron, by making a one-time donation, by using my Amazon referral link when you shop on Amazon, or by purchasing my D&D adventure, The Trickster's Labyrinth. 
I want to thank Mike Schley again for joining us on the show today. I hope you enjoyed our discussion as much as I did. You can find links to the resources Mike and I talked about today in the show notes for this episode over at starwalkerstudios.com. And you can also find among those links, uh, links to his map making tutorials, the Schleiscapes Kickstarter, which you should definitely check out. It's going strong. It's already funded. Um, by the time you hear this, there there's probably going to be a little over a week left on that Kickstarter. So time is definitely running out and you definitely want to go check that out. It's really good stuff. And also you can find a link to the interactive trailer for Schleiscapes on Instagram that we talked about in the interview today. You can also find Mike's contact information if you'd like to keep up on his future products or projects or both. <laughs> you can find all this and more at starwalkerstudios.com. I hope that you have a chance to play your favorite RPG this week. I hope you have a chance to run your favorite RPG. I'll be back soon with another episode of Game Master's Journey. Until then, game on. This has been a Starwalker Studios production, your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music, courtesy of Cloudwalker, Transboy, Renfield, Stanko, and Ish. See the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey. 